All right, everyone, we are at the two o'clock hour. Um, we are here for the June webinar for April oil production numbers. Um, remember to keep it on topic and within the realm of the director's cut. Um, that are those are my ground rules. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Lynn. Thanks, Allison, and thanks everyone for showing up for the uh, webinar in June. Uh, as Allison said, we're talking April production. We always lag a couple of months, uh, but as, as you can see from the numbers, if you're looking at the uh, director's cut, uh, pretty much happy, happy, happy. Um, we saw a production increase on the oil side of uh, just a little over or just under 25,000 barrels a day, uh, which is 2.4% increase. And I, I think that was more than, than many of us expected. Uh, a big increase on the natural gas side, over 100 million cubic feet a day, uh, a 6% increase. And uh, that, that's a, a very large increase. It indicates again the uh, concentration on the core area where the oil produces is produced in, uh, uh, along with a lot more natural gas. I think the good news there is that we held on to the gas capture. Uh, we stayed right at that 90% gas capture number even though we saw a 6% increase in natural gas production. I got a few more comments about gas capture when, when we get there. A little concern about uh, trust lands on Fort Berthold, and, uh, and we'll talk about what that means. But happy about the oil production, happy about the gas production. Uh, you can see in the oil well permitting area, uh, a lot of strength. We, we saw April drop down, but May back up to 100. Uh, drilling permits and two seismic permits. So industry appears confident that, that the fundamentals are there, that regardless of what you're seeing short term here on oil prices, that fundamentally inventories are going to come down, that the uh, OPEC uh, production cuts are, are going to do their job, and, uh, and that we will see stronger prices uh, out into the future. A little bit uh, head scratcher on the uh, today's North Dakota sweet crude price at 35.50, even with Dapple up and running. So uh, the the competition doesn't appear to have really kicked in there yet, and uh, and caused that that Flint Hills uh, North Dakota sweet price to to come back up towards WTI like one would expect. So we'll, we'll keep tracking that and see uh, as that as Dapple begins to move more and more barrels out of North Dakota if that competition kicks in and, and we see um, a drop in that differential between WTI and, and North Dakota Sweet. I think uh, the Bakken price is much closer to WTI, but North Dakota Sweet is, is certainly not. Um, 55 rigs running today. So again, uh, that looks like a, a confident industry. Uh, they added uh, five rigs since the May average. And, and so uh, we're seeing some of the small companies that came in and made some acquisitions. Uh, North Plains Resources over uh, north of Medora in the uh, um, Billings Nose area uh, has a couple of rigs running, drilling uh, long lateral Bakken wells in, in the middle Bakken. And uh, a company called Kraken uh, made an acquisition, bought some Continental acreage that uh, Continental wasn't excited about putting a rig on and, and they've got a rig running. So we've, we've seen some mergers and acquisitions now start to show up in the rig count. So uh, so there's some confidence there. Um, pretty much the same story in terms of the number of wells being completed. Obviously, uh, they must be very good wells in order to push production up like they have. But along with that, I think we're seeing our companies uh, open wells up more to their full potential. With, with uh, better oil prices, they're not restricting uh, wells as much. The, as you can see from the, the big increase in the non-completed wells, or the ducks, as uh, a lot of people like to call them, uh, the, the drilling rigs are outrunning the frack crews. And, and you can see that in the job numbers as well. Uh, industry's intention is to get to 25 crews this year, but they're well short of that. Uh, they're somewhere below 20, and uh, they're really struggling to hire qualified people. Uh, they, they, they want high-quality people uh, to 
to run, man their frat crews. And uh, most of those folks took jobs in Oklahoma or Texas uh, when, when things were ramping up down there and, and hadn't picked up in North Dakota yet. So if you go on the websites, uh, you'll see close to 200 uh, frat crew jobs listed for North Dakota, which uh, would be enough to, to man probably those four additional crews or, or more that they'd like to put in the field. So the rigs are out running the frat crews. With 55 rigs uh, and less than 20 frat crews, they, they won't be able to keep up. And so we're, we may see that duck inventory um, move up a little bit over, uh, over the course of the next few months. I think, uh, you know, road between road restrictions and problems hiring workover crews, uh, we saw an uptick in the number of inactive wells. That should come down with the summer months coming on, but remember we're talking April numbers here. So uh, uh, we hadn't really gotten fully out of winter and, and you know, into full activity mode. So I, I think the uh, inactive well count should be coming down as, as we get really into the nice dry summer months. Weather was great in April, uh, but, but again, it was still winter in North Dakota. We still had cold days and, uh, and road restrictions. It's hard to think back to the, those times uh, when you're sitting here in June and the temperatures have been over 100, uh, but they sure weren't in April. Um, I want to talk a little bit about gas capture. Uh, just a couple more items to talk about. Everything looks great except for the trust lands on Fort Berthold. And uh, that is the one area that's falling below the Industrial Commission target of 85% capture. Uh, there are some serious right-of-way issues. Uh, we've had several operators come in and talk to us. Uh, we had one operator brought in uh, some data to show us uh, that they had a right-of-way on the trust lands on Fort Berthold uh, that they, they thought they were going to be able to build the pipeline loop three years ago. And uh, now it's looking like August or September of this year, so a three-year delay. Uh, they have another significant right-of-way that's uh, impacting four fields that they operate in that uh, they thought they would be expanding that gathering system three years ago, and they still have no estimated time of arrival. So three years and counting on that right of way and no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, in conjunction with that, I made a comment about the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Secretary Zinke has uh, really expressed some interest in revising those right of way rules uh, to simplify the process. And uh, if you'd like, I, I can have Allison provide you a document, but it is an incredibly difficult and convoluted process. Uh, we, we have a document that that we'd be happy to provide that shows just how virtually impossible it is to get a right of way uh, on trust lands these days. So we're, we're going to struggle with gas capture on trust lands on Fort Berthold, and uh, we really need to do something to, to correct that problem. Um, the company that gathers and processes the gas really wants to get the gas and process it. The operators want to drill and complete their wells and sell the gas, but uh, we, we just can't get the pipeline right away. And then the last thing is you'll notice uh, um, a significant number of new underlined comments in the, the federal rules section. We've started to see major pushback from environmental groups on the Trump administration rollback of BLM and EPA rules. And uh, four of those, uh, four out of the seven, we've seen environmental groups uh, file amicus briefs or appeals or entirely new court cases uh, to, to push back on those rule relaxations. And uh, in all four of those, North Dakota is involved in litigation. So uh, we, we are tracking that and uh, we are using our legal counsel uh, to support the, the rule changes and uh, we'll just have to see what happens. But we're, we're really starting to see that now gel and, and show up in the courts, in the appeal courts and, uh, um, and in the new court cases. So uh, for the most part, I'd say happy, happy, happy. But there's a few mixed signals in there. Um, not really sure why DAPL hasn't affected today's uh, North Dakota sweet oil price yet. Struggling with right-of-ways and gas gathering on Fort Berthold and uh, simply 
cannot get enough qualified people to man all the frat crews that uh, industry would like to put in the field. So we'll take some questions. Okay, um, we'll stick with the, um, the last topic you discussed in terms of the rights of way. Um, is it the BIA in Fort Berth that's just stopping that process? It's uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, it's really their process. So it starts, um, you actually have to send someone out in the field and, and contact all of the allottees and get approval to even survey a right-of-way. So before you can even go walk the landscape and think about a right-of-way, you have to get approvals. Then, then you go out and walk the landscape and look at potential right-of-ways. And then every single allottee or owner uh, has to be identified and contacted. You have to have at least 51% of them approve. Uh, and once that has happened, it still has to go through the three affiliated tribes. There's a, there's a three-step process there. It, uh, it has to go through the energy department and then the tribal council, and then it has to cross the tribal chairman's desk and get his signature. And uh, then finally, uh, the paperwork goes over to the BIA office and all of that gets reviewed again at the BIA office uh, before a right of can be issued. And so uh, any place along that chain, uh, a change can happen and, and you get into this um, never ending story like this one right away that's affecting four oil fields that uh, has been three years in the process and no light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, we've, we, I've laid out uh, in a document for Governor Burgum uh, all the steps in that process and why it's problematic. He shared that with Secretary Zinke last week when he was in Washington, D.C. And, uh, and so we're, we're going to do what we can to help Secretary Zinke uh, straighten that out. Um, did you have something? Yes. Go ahead. It's on a little bit of a different subject, but given the fact that it's been abnormally dry in North Dakota, even with the rain that we've had today, and some counties are instituting burn bans, how is that going to affect drilling for oil? The, the question from the room was, uh, with burn bans, how does that affect drilling for oil? And uh, it certainly, it, it uh, connects with drilling for oil in the flaring area. Um, it, it results in really a, an increase in surveillance on the part of the county emergency managers and our field inspectors with regards to, uh, to flaring. We've been pressing industry really hard to go to the, uh, what's called an engineered flare. Um, almost no one uses the old traditional uh, flare that's made out of a piece of oil field pipe with some holes drilled in it. Uh, Almost everybody now uses an engineered flare that operates uh, in three phases, uh, one for the very low pressure tank vapors, uh, a separate flare for intermediate pressure gas, and then uh, a big flare for the high pressure gas. So the intersection is at flaring. Uh, we're going to be uh, really aggressive in terms of making sure people keep uh, flammable materials, weeds, grass, off the locations and, and uh, um, away from those flares. And uh, where, where that effort fails is usually if there's some type of major equipment failure and some oil goes to the flare and, and burning oil actually sprays out of that thing. But with the engineered flares, uh, that, that reduces that probability quite a bit too. So good question. Can you talk about um, development in McKinsey County? Um, there's a 1% drop from, in production from March to April, but then um, an 11, sorry, I'm reading that backwards. Uh, McKinsey County dropped 1% in production from March to April after 11% increase from February to March. Any explanation for that? Yes, um, so the question was what, what's going on in McKenzie County because there's a lot of uh, drilling okay, yeah. in McKenzie County and uh, uh, outside the norm it actually went down very slightly and it has to do with some, some problems that the gas uh, gathering companies are having and some uh, delayed completions and well restrictions as a result. So uh, northeastern McKenzie County, uh, very high gas oil ratio area, and uh, the operators are, are 
playing nice. They're delaying completions and, and restricting wells uh, in order to, to try to you know, keep the flaring numbers down. So uh, um, is it anything like drilling exhaustion or uh, you know, any, anything like that? I don't know if you know what that term means, but that, that means that you've drilled up all your lands, all, you've exhausted all your potential locations. Uh, they're not even close in McKenzie County, but, but they do have some problems. Uh, getting their natural gas to market. Which, interestingly enough, the production about in McKenzie County, um, I was running some figures for an upcoming teacher seminar and discovered that cumulatively, McKenzie County, Correct. Yeah, McKenzie County has produced over a billion barrels of oil since oil production has started. So. Yeah, that's our first billion barrel county. Yeah, so that's, that's <laughs> so a little aside, but. There's a lot of countries and in, uh, in places that haven't produced a billion barrels of oil, but McKenzie County uh, crossed that line. Yeah, just thought of it when we started. Nice little trivia Sorry about question. That. <laughs> we we might should play trivia with these guys. Yeah, sometimes. see how well we do. <laughs> um, uh, moving to uh, permitting decline, any explanation for the decline in April in permitting? Yeah, we uh, we discussed that some, and and I talked with a couple of oil companies. Uh, what it had to do with there again was uh, timing of drilling rigs and uh, and completions, and then also uh, a little bit of concern about uh, the OPEC extension of uh, of production cuts. And so uh, we had a couple of larger companies who uh, who were on the bubble about you know, whether to add a rig, whether to cut back a rig, and so uh, they they held off on their permits in April. Not a long-term trend, just a, just a little blip, uh, and, and it was oil price and, uh, and also uh, try, trying to decide just exactly when they were going to be able to deploy rigs and frack crews. Um, any, uh, you talked about you haven't seen any impact on price from DAPL, any other impacts that we've seen uh, in regards to DAPL yet? Uh, nothing I can put my finger on at this point. You know, we're just uh, 13 days in or 12 days in uh, to DAPL operations. And uh, um, so I I had thought maybe we would see that competition uh, raise that North Dakota sweet price. Um, I think it has raised uh, the Bakken price, uh, but there are some some people who didn't buy space on DAPL. And, uh, and they're... Uh, they're not getting the the posted price that that the other folks are. So, no, I, I haven't seen any other uh, impacts. Uh, there was some concern expressed uh, by a couple of folks. Uh, Dapple has some pretty tight tariffs on vapor pressure, so uh, we'll be okay through the summer here. But as we move into the winter months, uh, we we're going to have to be you know really paying attention to, to some of our oil conditioning and, and vapor pressure. Rules. Um, I think the 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 tight vapor pressure constraints that DAPL has in their tariffs uh, will really be helpful. I mean, it it kind of takes the the burden off of the industrial commission as far as enforcement. Because if you want to move your crude oil on DAPL, you got to meet the the uh, vapor pressure requirements. So uh, maybe, maybe yeah, just just to follow up on that, maybe this might be a question for Justin. Will that drive more traffic from rail hmm. Um The question was, will will the situation with vapor pressure drive more traffic on rail? Um, I don't think so. Uh, what I am seeing is uh, some pretty innovative new technology ideas coming to the oil patch uh, to help with the vapor pressure problem. Uh, last week, Friday, uh, I was in Grafton uh, watching a, an a experimental vapor pressure unit uh, in operation that, that's going to get deployed here this summer um, on a on a test site, and so uh, we'll we'll be excited to see how that works. It, it looks like a very innovative new way of doing it, and we've uh, through the Oil and Gas Research Council uh, funded some efforts to look at uh, ways to maybe chemically treat the oil. Or to use ultrasound in the, the separation process to keep the vapor pressure down. So I, I think that's the direction industry is going. Good. What do you expect with the rig count this summer? Are we at for the pinker? Do you think there's more room to grow? 
Yeah, question was uh, rig count. Where, where are we and is there room to grow? I, I really think we've topped out for 2017. Uh, I, I won't say that there, we might go one or two higher uh, temporarily, but oil prices, as, as you see in the director's cut, I'm now saying that uh, these low prices are going to extend well into the third quarter, maybe even the fourth quarter of this year. So the oil prices just don't support uh, adding drilling rigs at this point, especially with the inability to, to keep up with the frac crews. So it's very hard to justify uh, spending that money and then not completing those wells because you can't get a frac crew or, or the oil price is, is a little on the weak side. What's driving the, uh, the rig counts in like the Permian is uh, people have spent enormous amounts of money on land positions and, and they need to HVP those acres. So they're, they're in the same place uh, North Dakota was in 2012 where you, you just have to hire a rig regardless of the cost and, and get that lease held by production. HVP? Yeah. Held by production. I was going to ask you to say Sorry that. Sorry about the acronym. Yeah. I, I love them. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, if you think, does this look like how the landscape is going to stabilize moderately rising production, but lower um, production rig counts than during the boom of 13 14? Yeah, it really does. Uh, you know, everything that we've discussed uh, within the state agencies and, and with uh, Justin and the projections that he makes and, and with industry uh, indicate that uh, we will see slowly, slowly rising production and, and rate counts. But, uh, you know, it's going to be price dependent and uh, we don't have the oil price increasing until late next year, and even then, it's only maybe a $5 price increase. So uh, um, nothing, in, in the absence of, of some major disruption that, that causes a big price increase or a big price drop, uh, this is what it looks like for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay, um, I'm kind of gonna tie a couple of questions together here, but. Okay. Um, She's where, gonna paraphrase, that's yeah. what she's saying. Yeah, I'm scratching my head. Um, where do you think some of the pushback for permitting on trust lands is coming from? And are there fees that are higher with the BIA than our office? And uh, the answer to the second half of the question is yes, there are significant fees for uh, acquiring right away. Uh, the BIA charges fees, the three affiliated tribe charges fees, and their energy department charges fees. Uh, so do the, uh, the consultants and the surveyors that, that go out there and, and actually walk the land. And so every step of that process that I laid out has some fees associated with it and, and some timelines. Are there permitting um, fees? Because they specifically asked about permitting fees for pipelines, and we don't have permitting fees for pipelines. We don't have permitting fees for pipelines. I believe there are permitting fees within the BIA, and there certainly are with the three affiliated tribe. Um, and a big part of it is there are rules, lots of rules on the reservation about how far you need to be from the lake and from communities and from homes and from various things uh, with pipeline right-of-ways. And, and sometimes, uh, those rules intersect and, and there just is no pathway through, uh, particularly if a group of allottees say no. And, uh, and so the process is broken and, uh, and it's too long and, and there are far too many places uh, where it, it can completely come to a halt. Uh, so it's not, I've not heard a lot of concern about the fees or the cost of right away. That seems to be okay, although the people trying to lay the pipelines aren't entirely happy with it. Uh, it seems to be the length of the process and uh, how it can get vetoed multiple points along, along the way. Okay. Um, okay, so magic million barrel a day questions got to fit in there somewhere. Yes. Um, you still think we're going to go below a million? If so, when? Hmm. Um, at, at this rig count, and uh, even with the uh, just slightly under 20 frac crews we've got running, I don't think so. I think I think we're uh, we're going to skate by 
And uh, unless, you know, of course, we could get a harsh winter, and, and that'll, that'll be the real test, is uh, when, when we get into uh, late December, January, February time frame, and uh, what does the winter weather do to us? That's the one thing that probably could push us below uh, either that or, or a big drop in price. But that's the most likely uh, culprit, uh, the one thing that could push us below a million a day. Typically is. Yes, it is. We, uh, it's kind of weird this time of year to be doing a weather report and the director's cut, but we leave it in there so you don't forget when, when winter comes. Okay. I put in a last call for questions. Any last call from the... Yeah. <clears throat> last week, the Department of Energy released a report saying they expect United States production to go above 10 million barrels a day. Where does the Bakken and North Dakota fit in all of that? Sure. So the, que the question was, where do we fit into this uh, 10 million barrel a day plus uh, U.S. production? And uh, we, we're going to see decreasing market share. Uh, the the infatuation seems to be with the Permian Basin, and uh, people are employing rigs down there because they need to hold their leases. Um, that's driving production up. It looks like it's coming up slower than the, the uh, OPEC cuts are kicking in. So inventories are coming down, but that increased U.S. production has clearly postponed that, that time period where oil inventories get get down low enough to push us to $60 oil. So uh, I'm not seeing any of the market prognosticators talking about $60 oil in the, in the foreseeable future. So we're, we're looking at, I guess, lower market share. Uh, on the plus side, Dakota Access Pipeline is going to give us a better price per barrel. So, uh, so that should offset that to some, some extent. Okay, I'm sorry if this is a repeat question, but last month we were waiting for the OPEC cuts to come in. Now they've come in and we've seen a price drop. Do you see that? Do you see a sustaining of being below $50 a barrel for the foreseeable future? Um, I, I think the question was, you know, with the OPEC cuts, are, are we talking $50, sub-50, what are we talking? Um, so. I'll answer it with a, a, a few different things. One is that we saw some really strong price support at $45 oil, so, uh, so that's encouraging. That's, that's what the market fundamentals should have said, is that um, even with the disappointment in the OPEC cuts and the, and the increasing production coming out of the Permian, um, oil's worth more than $45 a barrel. Uh, 50 still looks like a pretty good average, uh, so I, I think we're looking at uh, above 50 before the end of the year, with us coming in right around that $50 mark for, for 2017. Um, and then by the end of 2018, we, we could see another $5 on top of that. But those, uh, those inventory numbers, that, that seems to be everybody's focus. Um, they were a little disappointed that OPEC didn't go for bigger cuts to try, but OPEC looked at it and said, well, the, the Permian is just going to try to offset, you know, if we, if we cut more. And fundamentally, what they've been doing is working. Uh, and then last week, of course, we saw an inventory build, and that really uh, shook the markets up, uh, along with what happened in the British election and what happened in the French election. And, you know, I mean, there's just lots of factors out there. But, no, I, I think we're still looking at, a roughly fifty dollar average for twenty seventeen and another five bucks for eighteen. Okay. Uh, I had one more question, but we'll save it for Justin because it's Apple capacity. Thanks everyone. We'll switch to JK. <laughs> so keep them in this bowl? Yeah. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Justin Crankstead, Director of the North Dakota Pipeline Authority. Um, we'll get right up uh, going here with the updates from uh, production around the neighboring uh, states. As you can see, Montana, South Dakota holding steady. Uh, again, zero rigs operating in either of those two planes right now. 
um, with all the activity concentrated on the North Dakota side of the Williston Basin. Uh, there has been some shifts you'll notice on slide three uh, as far as the percentages of how crude oil has been moving out of the region. Um, April had a few things going on and I'll touch on those here in just a moment. Um, this pie chart itself may not be the best visual for this, but slide four, it's going to be uh, even more obvious to take a peek at. Um, you'll notice uh, the blue line, uh, sharp trend word up in the estimated pipeline uh, utilization, and then a, a very significant decrease in that red line, the refine. And so uh, Tesoro, their Mandan refinery, had gone down for turnaround um, in the month of April. And so uh, basically for that entire month, the only refining capacity we had was roughly the 18 to 20,000 uh, of capacity in Dickinson. And so any growth in production um, was estimated to be uh, put onto the rail, I'm sorry, onto the pipeline uh, side of the transportation network. And so that puts rail estimates right around that 250,000 or so uh, barrels per day for the month of April. And the destinations for that little update uh, now, even further uh, divergence between the east and the west coast uh, market share. You'll see in the purple line, uh, that is pad five, which is the west coast, uh, Pacific Northwest uh, refining complexes, uh, taking now majority of that crude by rail to their facilities. And I expect that to continue uh, to diverge and we'll continue to see the market share on a percentage basis uh, lean more towards the west coast than in the other uh, refining regions with the market uh, as we see it today. Just an update on pricing uh, from the different pad regions around the U.S. Uh, you can see again, pad one continued to have the, the higher priced markets in March. Uh, however, uh, we're seeing majority of those barrels trending towards the west coast uh, refineries. You can see up in the Pacific Northwest, the, the black uh, barrels represent the refining capacity. So that's really where those barrels are headed. Um, there is a lower transportation cost by rail to the west coast than to the east coast or to the Gulf. And so um, now with access by pipe to the Gulf and with uh, refiners on the east coast uh, verbally uh, confirming that they were going to be moving away from crude by rail from the Williston Basin in the current market and, and going more towards waterborne deliveries. Again, uh, full expectation that the Pacific Northwest will continue to be um, a destination for the volumes that do decide to leave um, by rail. And just an update on pricing for the U.S. Uh, about $2.32 uh, difference between Brent WTI pricing um, as of this morning and then a $2 premium for that LLS light Louisiana sweet uh, crude oil down in the Gulf Coast. So again that's the, the market that we expect the Bakken barrels to be uh, competitive with once those barrels get to the Gulf Coast. On the truck import exports, uh, very similar numbers, not a whole lot of change uh, March to April. Uh, continue to see large volumes of, of crude moving back and forth uh, across the border. Again, the, these are not long haul uh, barrels being trucked. Uh, they're likely just crossing the border for a marketing reason and then getting onto a Canadian pipeline system for uh, transportation back into the US. So again, these are not barrels that are being trucked multiple hundreds of miles. Um, <clears throat> they, they are staying within the, the basin itself. And as Lynn alluded to, no change at all on the, the gas flaring percentages. The reason for those flaring percentages are identical March to April. So very consistent, even though we did see a large increase in gas production month over month. Um, as you note here, again, uh, very little change. And our gas volumes in that gray line now at, as Lynn said in his report, uh, a new high, 1.8. Uh, BCF billion cubic feet of gas being produced um, and then all, all expectations are that we're going to continue on um, in the future past two BCF and, and onward from there. And gas uh, capture, how quickly the wells are getting connected to the gas uh, gathering companies. Again, trending very closely. We did see a few more wells come online than got connected in the month of April. So that's something that uh, to continue to watch, see if it's just a one month uh, anomaly. Uh, or if this is something to, to be concerned with, um, if the gas gathering companies are not able to, in the current environment, keep up with the pace of, of completions. And then just very quickly, uh, just an update on natural gas liquids production. So 142,000 barrels a day coming from the plants themselves. This does not include, include any natural gas liquids that 
are left in uh, the pipeline network. And so, and when I say that, those are natural gas liquids that get put in with the dry gas uh, being delivered to, again, homes and businesses around the region. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, the first question that we had that I held over was about capacity on DAPL. Um, any time frame for when they expect to be up to 570,000 barrels a day? So the, the current capacity, so um, I don't recall the dates exactly off the top of my head, but um, Dakota Access did go out for a supplemental open season process and they received an additional 50,000 barrels a day of capacity commitments. So the, the nameplate capacity starting out is 520,000 barrels per day. Um, it's not uncommon for a pipeline company to have staggered um, volumes being committed to it. So a company Again, this is all proprietary, so I, don't, I do not have any details of how this has worked out with this particular pipeline, uh, but there may be situations where a company or a shipper may not have to deliver all of their barrels from day one. They may be able to stagger in uh, their volume commitments just depending upon um, how their contracts were structured. So when do we get all the way up to full capacity, 570,000 barrels per day? I don't know that anyone from any public data source would have any color on that. That's something that the companies keep pretty pretty private. I would not expect it to be immediate just from, from day one, just knowing what I've seen in the past with pipeline systems. But eventually as market uh, conditions uh, shift and production grows, uh, it's not unlikely that they would get up to capacity. Um, any push from industry to have pipelines going west to cut down on rail usage? No, it's, so the, I'm not aware of any public uh, discussions or projects being proposed that would move uh, Williston Basin or any mid-continent barrels for that matter west to uh, West Coast refineries. Have you heard any news on uh, rail terminals being totally shut down? No, so in North Dakota we've got a couple different types of, of rail facilities we have. Uh, some of the smaller, the manifest ones that, that were not set up for what's known as a unit train or, or roughly 100 car, uh, 100 car trains coming in and out at one time. Even when uh, the number of years ago when we saw the unit train facilities pick up and gain more market share, we did see some of the smaller manifest type facilities um, move away from crude by rail. Um, maybe not entirely, but uh, greatly reduced uh, numbers or volumes from those facilities. Um, I suspect without having any, again, hard data to back this up that most of those manifest facilities now are are looking at other business lines or, or different services and the, the facilities that are continuing to operate today are going to be the, the well-connected unit train facilities throughout uh, Western North Dakota. Okay. So I am just curious, I, you may have answered this many, many months ago. Why is it cheaper to to go to the West Coast by rail than East Coast? Is it is it a case of a distance, or is there something else there? Yeah, uh, so the question flows on the webinar: you know, what why the difference between West Coast deliveries by rail versus East Coast and the cost of service? Um, Distance-wise, it is shorter. It, it's more of a direct route. Um, in some cases, uh, carriers were had uh, or shippers were having to change uh, rail providers, and so there was some changeover. In some cases, they were moving it by rail to a terminal, which it would then be put on a barge and moved by, by water. And so um, the shorter distance, the more direct um, connection, one carrier has driven the economics uh, in favor of the West Coast. What are your thoughts on price differential? Why hasn't DAPL raised the price of North Dakota oil as predicted? Yep. So, so my my expectation is that it's going to take probably six to 12 months before we really start to see what the new normal is uh, within the basin. So again, this is the first time North Dakota's uh, really had adequate pipeline capacity since we had uh, really heavy Bakken development within the state itself. And so it's going to take a while for the market to adjust and uh, for everything to, to realign. We may see some ups and some downs in the process. Um, because again, this is a new environment for both uh, the refining and the shipping com community as well as the, the producing community. Do you expect that the 70% figure for the pipeline capacity that some you think is that going to readjust next month? Or what are you expecting with that? Yeah, so 
when we move into into May, uh, what, what was occurring in May, uh, DeSoto was still down for a good portion of May, and so that's going to skew the numbers a little bit. We really didn't have Dakota access on in, in full commercial service till June, so the May numbers may not look a lot different. Um, really, once we get into the June, July type production reports, that's when we're really going to start to likely see the big differences. Okay. Um, did you have a number for what you said was going on at the Dickinson refinery? Uh, no, so the capacity there, um, 18 to 20,000 barrels per day, which is what was built into the estimates here. Uh, well, that being said, the soil is down. Do you know when the Dickinson schedule for turnoff? I don't know the, the schedule for the Dickinson facility. Explain what turnaround means. Yeah, so, so for those in the webinar, what occurs during a, a refinery turnaround? And so every number of years, um, each each refinery handles their, their schedule differently, uh, but they will uh, bring in crews from around the U.S., specialized pipe fitters, uh, fabricators, and they will go through every component of the refinery. They'll, they'll shut the refinery down and then go through any type of maintenance procedures that would be required. Uh, pipes, valves getting replaced, fixed, uh, pumps, everything just gets reworked um, all at one time versus trying to maintain in, in some more frequent type period. Good question. Yeah. Okay. That is all that we have. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We will call that a wrap for June. Okay. Does that mean we can have a wrapper? <laughs>